Richard, how are you? Well, how are you doing? Uh, doing well. I, I was just briefly talking to you off mic. Uh, just, just getting by, trying to enjoy each day. I know we're all in different locations around the country, around different countries. So let's just go straight into it then. Uh, welcome to the podcast. I am very fascinated by the music that was shared with me and the music you both worked on. It's strangely up my alley. I wasn't expecting it. I, I wasn't sure what it was when I was first shown it. And I really, really love music like that. It was beautiful. I, I put it on on my nice sound system. I listened to it a few times. And I even enjoyed the other interview you did. So I would like for you both to kind of just talk about who you are, what you do, and maybe start getting into the music and, and why you made this type of music, where how you got into it. Well, many questions. I mean, we weren't like <laughs> unsimilarly, not unsimilarly, not dissimilarly to you. We were also unsure of what this music was when we were first making it, I think. Because um, really, we just got kind of thrown into a room together and asked to make some music. And we had never even met in person. And in fact, we never met in person uh, during the process of making this record, which was the first for both of us. Um, yeah, we so met. So how did you get connected? We met, I mean, it was during the pandemic and um, we got connected through Splice, um, this this uh, online music creation um, slash community. And Susie had worked with them before and um, through the friend I got connected to them and they were interested in 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 kind of fostering new collaborative projects um, and seeding new works and so they basically commissioned us to make a album and a, and a pair of sample packs that were made from that same material that we were making the album with mm. and who's I where'd the idea come from for like following the natural rhythm of the body of the heart of the pulse that was, um, that, yeah. yeah, that was um, an idea that I had started exploring um, on a, a record that I made called Music for Heart and Breath, um, and a bunch of different pieces of music that were using that same idea of just using the, the heartbeats and the breathing rights of the musicians to guide the tempos of the music. Um, and uh, the work that I had done previously was much more kind of um, classical in nature, much more composed on paper and sort of every note written. Um, and uh, I, I thought that I, yeah, I, thought, I just thought there was a lot more to explore in that idea in terms of different musical relationships. And, uh, and I wanted to do something to keep working with that same very simple basic idea, but that it's such a fruitful place to start musically and, and, um, just take it into more improvisatory territory and kind of, you know, compose rougher forms and do something that was a little more arising out of the playing rather than arising out of something you're writing on paper. Um, and I knew Susie as a really great improviser and interesting composer um, and thought this would be a cool opportunity to follow that thread of that, that music um, or that basic musical idea and just take it into a whole new place how about you Susie how did, how did yeah. you get into it um, yes yeah, so Splice introduced us and um, I think we were both uh, curious and our collaborative people and it was um, it, it was it was a wonderful connection we found that we had certain things aesthetically in common I think both Richard and I are connected in our own personal ways to the environment and how how we are and move in space and in, in the environment that's very uh, important, I think essential and important to each of us. And I, I also liked very much when he offered this idea because we were thinking, how do we, how do we first just enter this? We've never played music together before. We've never been physically in the same space before. And I, I liked very much the idea and also he had shared his music, it was beautiful. And the idea and practice of following the heartbeat, following your breath, I mean, it's something that has been around for a long time in a lot of traditional music. 
And also, um, I play Philippine Southern Gong music, also in Gong styles, uh, and also being a percussionist. It, it's something that that centers a lot around the heartbeat, also certain things. So it's it was something very natural to to think about. And well, breath cycles. I think that's something that connects many of us musicians in regardless of the instrument we play. So I was up for it, although I thought also it's it's a very unique way in which Richard was introducing this into contemporary concepts. And I was into exploring it and seeing how we could collaborate and come up with something together. And then I was curious because in studio, you know, as a percussionist, I have to be able to hear my heartbeat. And um, depending on the dynamics and, and what I'm playing, that could be a challenge. It seemed like for for something, you know, for people being two people being thrown into a, a musical collaboration that had never played before and to not actually, you know, and a, and a drummer and bassist at, at that, which is typically, you know, that's a <laughs> that's a rhythm section right there. Um, it seemed like that the idea is it's like it just created a kind of a nice framework within which we could we could reasonably try and make music over a distance and have it not feel like it was lacking something because of the distance between us and because of not being able to be in a room together and work on stuff together in, a, in the same space. It seemed like that idea would be the right framework would provide kind of a, a scaffold within which to work that would also be, it's like very forgiving um, in terms of, you know, we're not, you're not trying to be locked necessarily in the way that a rhythm section might normally try to be locked if they were playing any other kind of music except this, you know, it's just, it's like just seemed like a way to contain the natural distance and the remoteness and the separation that we were gonna just that was the that was the backbone of of the process of doing this, right? It was being far away from each other, being, you know, during lockdown and during COVID and and it just seemed like this idea would be very unifying in some kind of fundamental way. And yet that allowed us to just be very far away from each other and not be in a room, you know, connecting musically in the very physically present way in which music is typically made with musicians. Yeah, that's so fascinating because being a musician and, and playing and doing a lot of improvisation, you do realize how much your heart rate is a part of this thing that connects the other two, three, four, five people with you. So to do it across time and, and space, um, would you like record, how would you, do that with the heartbeat how would you do yours and send it to her to play on like how did that work over the internet yeah back and forth really sometimes like i would have a specific idea of oh can you know play like tune a bunch of drums to this kind of cluster of notes and then can you just play breath cycles like and try one where you're just playing your inhalations and then being silent and then one where you're just playing your exhalations and then being silent for the inhalations and then one where you're playing in and playing out on the same note and then one where you're inhaling and playing one drum and then exhaling and playing the other one you know just these very simple ideas um that i would throw at susie and then she would she would go and play with that and and record herself doing so and then send it back to me and i and then i would be like get excited about something that she had played and i would play on top of that and always always you know using one way or another using the the heart rate or the breath rate um, to guide what we were doing um and yeah and it was just a lot of back and forth thing really yeah um, and it tracked a lot it tracked a lot it's very late <laughs> for a duo for a duo album it's extremely a layered yeah i can hear that it, there's a lot going on for the two of you um so both of you have a lot of experience doing improvisation working with multiple instruments so Susie, are you just a percussionist? Or do you play other instruments besides percussion-based things? I'm pretty much a percussionist. Percussion. Yeah, I play a lot of different percussion. I mean, and I started on percussion. I was piano, still percussion. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And and Richard, you? How about yourself? Uh, my main love is the double bass, um, but I play guitar and I play piano and I play percussion to some extent and. I like to use the studio as a bit of an instrument and mm -hmm. oh yeah 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 so 
you both have a background with playing music for a long time. How many have you always done improvisation? Is this something that like it's not easy to do um, improvisation in a very uh, deliberate way sometimes where it's like somewhat controlled, but you're still within those start and finishes you're doing improvisation. So clearly this probably wasn't your first time. Where did you start to do pro improvisation? When did you start getting into it in your career? Oh, I guess Richard, you first. Um, for me, it would have been, I, um, I have an ensemble that I started in university called Bell Orchestra, and that group did a lot. That was kind of my first experience in really group, group, group improvisation. Um, that group did a lot of improv. I mean, we wrote pieces together and composed and had real set, you know, set pieces as well, but there was lots of improv built into our process was all kind of a basically improvisatory process of writing together, but group writing. Um, and yeah, I didn't, I didn't ever do like the kind of, I didn't go like the jazz route to get to improvisation. I just kind of was a improviser towards composition, I mm -hmm. suppose. Um, that being, you know, just being able to sit down, play something and have that lead towards a composition and often feeling like at the end of a process like often you know that ensemble we would record ourselves always and I'd always end up feeling like the most interesting music was what we were doing when we were on our way to finishing a composition and I always often preferred to listen to the sort of the raw recordings of us figuring out what a piece was more than the finished thing itself mm -hmm. and and uh that sensibility has definitely followed me around in life although i do a lot of different things musically um and uh yeah and I, I try and really harness that sensibility this kind of the kind of first thought best thought thing in the moment but be re like the thing that occurs in the moment is probably the best thing probably the best idea you're gonna have is the one that you're not thinking about before you do it so much of the time um but i'm I get kind of obsessed about recording that and trying to, you know, tr just trying to get that, that weird magic moment recorded as, as it's happening. Um, and then coming back and, you know, at great length sometimes as was the case with this record, like at great length, pouring over, pouring over a, a bunch of recorded takes of improv and finding the best bits and saying, Oh, there, like, there's the composition, like all, in all of this sort of, unfettered un, unmeasured thought musical thought is a is the groundwork and sometimes the entirety of a of a really good composition and all the little details that happen because you're just exploring it in the moment end up being the most like important things that your ear wants to latch onto as a listener in a recording often right absolutely it's it, it is the best part about improvisation and I love it. I love it so much. I've never, I never feel so present, except for the moments I'm just have an inch in my hand. In my case, a guitar, and you're just. It's not. It's not that you're winging it. There's a lot of like you both have been playing music in some way for a long time. So, you're not just like making up stuff. You're you're using a tool and your experience and your knowledge of music to like harness a moment in a somewhat controlled way. But even like what people would call a mistake, it's not really a mistake. It's just like a small in-between moment to get to the next place to like fill in whatever it is you're trying to do and I don't know I really like it I, that's the beauty of improvisation and so everything you said it's like it made me smile because it's it's so true and it I also enjoy the capturing of it it's so cool to just take something that happened and it's gone and you can never fully recreate it um and, and Susie how about yourself what, when did you first start getting, getting into improvisation and following that path it's a different world well i think for me it's a little different and um i think it's something i've always did since i was a little, a little girl oh wow and even though i studied you know classical piano and i sang in choirs i think it's very cultural and also just a way of being a way of thinking and then i think that awareness as we grow older how we use it in practice whether it's something that's coming out in music or it's coming out in art or just a way of daily practice, it is definitely, um, it's definitely a tool and a skill that I use also to compose. I don't always um, 
I don't differentiate that. I think there's different ways to compo of composing practices for myself, and I also um, do a variety of things. Even I think when I'm field recording, sound recording, it, it's something that it, that shapes decisions. Um, and this is it is really interesting that uh, Richard and I had this opportunity to create this music, you know, using these different kinds of tools of how we're listening, how we're creating in the moment, and how we're sharing it and, and sculpting it. Um, it. It's interesting because traditionally we might, right, in a, in a traditional Western music environment, we would notate it all out or maybe have very, uh, very structured sections that might have improvisation or embellishments, but, um, Sometimes there's other different styles where it's really something that's expected to have happen at the same time. So if you are going to notate something or if it's going to be something that comes from an oral practice or an oral tradition that comes down, that's something that could be integrated. And I think particularly because we're working in, in with these concepts of the heart and the breath, it's something that's so innate, it's, it's going to be open to a lot of different kinds of practices, how we're going to create that music, how, how the composition is going to be made. And it is really a lot like our body, you know? I mean, we have improvisations that are happening in our bodies all the time, and we, we don't control all of those things, right? They're, or thinking about theories of chaos, and stuff. it's just, we don't, we live in these places that it's not a place where we control it, but we learn how to, to live in it and how to, to be a part of it. That's, that's, um, I don't know, I find always something to, that I'm constantly learning about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's wonderful. I, I never thought about it that way. It is, life is a little chaotic, so making up music you know rhythm and sound and pitch sometimes a little bit of noise putting it together it's uh it's not just poetic it is like this real full-fledged expression that not everyone gets to enjoy do you both of you have probably have clearly done controlled music maybe with the metronome and it's practice and it's rehearse and it has a start middle beginning finish and you play it live how does that do you, what do you, is there a, which, a certain one, let me just think of a way to phrase this, is there a certain style that you would prefer, or does it depend on how you're feeling in the moment when it comes to very controlled music that's still wonderful and people love too, just making up in the moment? Is there a certain, on that spectrum, is there a certain place where you personally lie as a musician, as a person, or do you kind of enjoy the whole gambit for different reasons? I Actually, personally yeah, been, for different reasons. Different reasons. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I figured I, I, yeah, it's a hard one because when it comes to the controlled music, I, I, that's a weird way to put it, but that's just how I'm going to say it. The controlled music of a metronome and, and a time restraint and uh, sections and it's written out and rehearsed it still is really beautiful because it's a different interaction from the patrons, the attendees, the people around you listening versus when it's improvised in the moment. The The crowd reacts differently. I think they get different things out of them, out of those experiences. That's why I really enjoy going to like a really small spot where someone's doing improv music. It's like a you get lost in a different way versus sitting there singing along the songs, you know. Um, when you first started to go back and forth together was it easy to communicate this type of idea with each other you, you guys seem like you're on the same page about things same wavelength but when you're talking about breathing the inhale and exhale can you go further into that i don't know if every listener knows exactly what you mean by that like playing music to that if one of you could elaborate on that you well know, it takes many forms but like basically every Every element in this music is tied um, very directly to either the the length of a of the breath cycles of one of us or the heartbeat cycles of one of us. So sometimes 
oftentimes we would literally be wearing stethoscopes and playing along with our heartbeats and doing that in different ways. Um, and like on the first, on the, the composition work I had done previously using that idea, it was very, very apparent how that was happening, very spelled out, very kind of like one note per beat of a heartbeat and sort of, uh, you know, a note played at the exact length of an inhalation or a note played at the length of an exhalation. Um, and some of that is going on on this record as well, but this, we really like, are we good for sound? It sounds like someone's running a vacuum cleaner or something. I think this I, was my laptop. Where is it? Okay, it's just oh, checking. Okay. I think it's my. I know. I, I don't. I was like, "Is there a tractor at?" Yeah, it sounds like a sounds like a vacuum cleaner running. <laughs> I think it's just my laptop making it a okay. fan. I don't know. I don't okay. hear anything. That's oh, only the I get. Okay. The fan. Cool. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh. And on with this music, we, like we really ran in different directions with those very simple parameters, but. A lot of the time, like you'll hear it, it's like there'll be a, a bass marimba that's just playing, or a or an upright bass that's just playing a simple motif that's exactly in sync with a heartbeat. Boom, 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 and maybe it's changing melodically, maybe it's changing chordally, but the basic rhythm is just there, and it's a and it's a heartbeat. One of the pieces you hear the actual recorded heartbeat through a digital stethoscope, um, and you know the upright bass is long. For the whole piece and then other times it's like they'll be drawn out you know Susie will be doing a, 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 a roll on a tom um, for the length of a breath and then changing pitches to a different tom for the length of an inhale you know for an inhale and an exhale and she'll um, or she'll do a, a roll in and a roll out on the same drum for the inhalation and the exhalation and just using those those you know those involuntary body rhythms as as the physical guidelines that are telling you how long to play for and you're not trying you know we're not thinking about bars and we're not thinking about overall tempo or just being locked to these basic rhythms and so um and you know so like one of the first pieces that that we that we made was the first recording was Susie um Susie just playing with, like with a gong a kind of a Chinese gong um and a, and a snare drum and just, yeah, playing her heartbeat in this simple way and kind of following it. And, you know, heartbeats are kind of steady, but they go up and down and up and down <laughs> like crazy, actually. Um, and so there's all kinds of really beautiful organic tempo variation and rhythmic variation that comes from just following that. And even from, you know, sometimes you miss a heartbeat. You're listening for it and you kind of miss it and you stagger and you catch it again, but it's fine. It makes it really interesting rhythmically. And then... So Susie like would maybe send me something that she had just recorded of herself playing to her heartbeat. And then I would either play off of that, you know, and so we'd have opposing heartbeats where then if I was playing upright bass or piano in sync with my heart, you have these, you know, you have these kind of hocketing rhythms that are interacting with each other in, in parallel, but unmetered and not in the same tempo kind of ways, but are clearly relating to each other. And they're kind of, they're kind of circling each other, orbiting each other in these kind of aleatoric little musical pockets. Um, or conversely, sometimes she would have, she would, she played, you know, she played one piece that was just like, I think it was like a minute long improv that she did on a, on a snare drum and a gong that I fell really in love with right away and kind of looped it so that it happened twice. And I was like, there, that's a form. That's such a beautiful little form. Let me just play something to that. And then I actually followed, exactly with her as if we were a rhythm section you know but um and then played a bass progression that happened a few times um against that rhythm but like locked in with her rhythm but that so in that case it's Susie's following her heartbeat and I'm following Susie you know and so there's just all these this sort of infinite different ways in which that really basic idea can be can be you know spread out between musicians and between musical elements that can make something really complex uh, and really musical happen and it and it can just inform it with so much so much interesting musicality um that is maybe you know it's maybe a little outside of 
what your musical instincts might tell you if you didn't have a set guideline like that, you know, a set parameter, a set instruction. And it's just something, you know, it's just a, in a lot of ways, it's just a, a, a compositionally enabling device. Um, just, you know, something that puts you in motion in a certain way and gives you a certain instruction. And then you get to the end of following that instruction for a while and you realize, look at all this music we've made and, you know, that, that has this really unique and kind of binding aesthetic thread running through the whole thing in terms of how we play together, even though in Susie and I's case, we had no previous relationship of playing together, you know, which is a pretty unique spot to find yourselves in as musicians, I think. And so having something so simple and unifying be what's holding us together musically was a really, was I think a really, you know, kind of a liberating factor. It's very organic. I mean, it's very live. You know, you think about in studio sessions that people may play to click tracks or they play to certain things. It does not feel like that. We're, you're definitely playing with a being, you know, and a living being, and it it informs how you play very differently. The intention, especially because the intention is to focus on that, which a lot of times it's very sub. You know. Thankfully, it's very subconscious. I mean, how many breaths do we take in a day? And our heartbeats are working nonstop, right? I mean, I can't imagine our being aware of every single one um, in in just a day. So, so that's uh, I don't know. That's really fascinating. Yes, Richard, how it how it connects. There's like a, it's a very simple concept but a very deep concept because it's it's tapping into our beings Mm -hmm. and asking us to center ourselves in a way that we're not always conscious about Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i've never heard of this style before have you guys heard of this before is this maybe the first (laughs) known concept of doing this no i mean like when i when i wrote the first piece (laughs) I was like, how come no one has done this before? And I went, you know, I wasn't like patting myself on the back. I was just like, no, seriously, like this is this most simple, like stunningly simple, basic idea, kind of in terms of the the involuntary rhythms we're all born with. And Mm -hmm. when I originally had the idea, I was going to include blinking in in the process and i decided to let that go for later but one day blinking will probably make it you know and then blink, thinking make it you know? i just um i just i'm uh, richard i'll come back around to that because i just saw uh, a sound and uh, visual artist who's doing doing music where it's all um it's all coming from the eyes stimulating it oh, oh neat cool <laughs> I, I, i'm just forgetting the name but i will I will oh, come back to that. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. yeah. I don't think anyone has been doing it in in this manner. Like I said, it's it's mm. but it is definitely something that connects deeply. Of course. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, in um in drumming, there's a lot of drumming culture a, a lot with the the polymeters and just how the heart is a polymeter and it doesn't it doesn't sync like how we try to put a metric onto all music it's not actually mm-hmm. how we we live and breathe and no it's very flexible a healthy heartbeat actually fluctuates quite a lot yeah i'm personally not yeah. a big fan of metronomes but there's a time and place for them but i really enjoy just the ebb and flow of sound music expression um so i really take to what you guys are talking about it's I don't know. It's very natural, very humanistic to just go along with your heart. So it's funny that, Richard, you said you're like, I I don't understand how no one's done something like this before. And was this born out of the fact that the idea like people aren't near each other so we can connect through this? Or is this it was just an idea? And because you were far from each other, like, let's just try it. Yeah, it was like, as I say, I'd, I'd done this album's worth of compositions previously using the same basic idea, but very, very different music from what me and Susie are doing. Mm hmm. Um, but I really wanted to just explore. It just felt feels like eternally kind of fertile ground, um, and I'd never done something more improvisatory with it. And it just like I'd, I'd seen Susie play music before, and was like really loved her improvising and her natural instincts. And it just felt like, oh yeah, this this could be a really fertile fertile collaboration um, compositionally in that way. You know, just having two people that are far away from each other and 
get to put this very simple idea into into motion and so it doesn't matter that you're not in the same place at the same time because you're you know you're still bound by this really this really um kind of contained framework by committing to that you that that's the way that you're playing the music right you're just mm-hmm. following these internal rhythms so it doesn't matter that you're not in the same room being locked in together because you can you're kind of locked in in this ether <laughs> in between ephemeral kind of space um of like you're you're locked into a non-locked in-ness <laughs> that, you know you're you're yeah. both you're bound by this idea and you're kind of united in that you're both obeying these internal and voluntary rhythms, but you don't have to worry about the metronome and you don't have to worry about getting the, yeah. getting the, the hot take in this, in the studio, you know, you, <laughs> at, or, yeah, it's like you, you're letting these really gentle involuntary propulsive internal rhythms be what's pushing you forward and you're just going yeah i'm just sticking with that whoa my heart's slowing down okay i'm sticking with that and you don't have to worry about the other person and but you know getting to explore that over time and getting to build up an album in sort of compositionally in layers and each adding things oh that sounds really good why don't we add bass marimba to that why don't we do some you know why don't we add some Hmm. piano or some extra bowed bass or Susie asked me to experiment with my voice at one point. So a voice like mm-hmm. voice made its way into a, a couple of the pieces and, you know, just really getting to take our time and build it up based on what we were hearing and what we were feeling and what we were wanting to hear. Um, that's, you know, that's where the studio as a, as a compositional tool and compositional environment is very liberating, obviously mm-hmm. um, yes. different from being a live ensemble in a room, which would have its, its own strengths and its own, you know, so differences very different very different yeah. yeah do you um have you both played shows together through this method yet <laughs> no not yet are you not going yet. to <laughs> working on it working on it yeah yeah we're working on it <laughs> i would yeah. love to see it and if you come through chicago i'll i'll bring some friends they'll be a little confused they'll be great <laughs> 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 how um so you're both you're both musicians how has how has this changed the way you navigate music? Has it changed anything about the way you think about music? Having this insight to your heart or her heart or his heart leading the way of music, has it has it done any differences in the way you are a musician? Richard, you can go. Um, it's It kind of just reaffirms saying earlier, like that kind of first thought, best thought thing, like that an un an unmetered and unmeasured and un you know an unpremeditated musical thought or musical element f- just committing to those things and uh, can can yield maybe the best musical result or something you know if there is a best like it can it can just yield something really fruitful and really alive um, you know just. I think just the act of committing to something that's slightly outside of your control musically can actually end up being this really musical thing, you know, rather than necessarily leaving people to their, to their own instincts all of the time musically. Cause you know, you, you it's the same way that your, your mind, you know, the same way that your mind leads you down, down well trodden paths because when you're left alone with your mind long enough you know the older you get you can you can really like wear you know you can wear deeper grooves into your into your own mind pathways you can do the same thing musically you know and i think whenever whenever we introduce elements um you know external elements that really pull us out of our our routine ways of being we, we learn from that and we expand from that and it forces, you know, it forces us to kind of open up and loosen the, loosen the reins a little bit. Um, and for me, that's just kind of an eternal lesson of those things. You know, it's great to be from, be familiar with your own, with your own musical mind. And there's a, you know, there's a beauty that comes from that and a confidence and a familiarity that comes from that, but it's also so, it's just so great and so fruitful to introduce elements that require you to step outside of your normal ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. How about you, Susie? What do you, how do you feel about that? 
Um, let's see. <laughs> I, I think it definitely has deepened the way that I listen and, and therefore also the way that I play because it's requiring that kind of meditation in practice in real time. And it's also very poly for me as, as a percussionist and a drummer. It's something as if we're, you know, um, also these multiple, um, have these multiple sides. I mean, our, our heart has these multiple sides and in, in our breath. So it is it is very poly centered for me. Like I will be doing something, but the breath is moving in another way and the heart is moving in another way. So you have this little ensemble that you're actually offering up that we're actually offering up to each other, you know, that all of these parts that are connected, we're not really flattening it out and then um, presenting it to you, you know, we're kind of really keeping it in that these different dimensions. But it is something that I definitely think I related to from, like, from drum lineage. So, but what's very unique also, or one of the unique things is expanding on it and asking my ear to expand on that in the way that Richard is hearing and, and playing and composing and improvising and how I'm going to relate to that. So I, I, I think about that. One of my um, wonderful mentors um, who passed uh, the late Milford Graves and um, he used to talk about when we would do poly meters about different limbs having different characters so that you know it's not just that when you're you're playing all of these poly parts that you're playing these parts but they have full-on nuances of different characters and I I, I connect I, I like to think of that idea sometimes when I'm when I'm thinking of this this idea that that Richard asked me to jump into Hmm. That's really that's really beautiful. Different limbs, different thoughts, different ideas per per uh, appendiment of the body. That's cool. And where do you want to carry this on in the future? Would you like to do something like this again, or is it just something to do now as an experiment, as a musician, as an artist, and then onto something new? Or you you, you think you might interweave it into the future of how you make music? Like we got to play some live shows first before we know the end of it. I guess you're right. <laughs> we have the before the horse. <laughs> yeah, haven't haven't barely been in a room together yet. So first, know. first. <laughs> that's so interesting. Not many people could say that. I mean, that's yeah, it's, it's, it's bizarrely <laughs> a, like, so deeply a product of this exact time, which is wild. I always feel like I. I know. I try, try try and sequester myself from from the time I'm in in certain ways, but this is like no, this is we really did something of this time in some ways. Right, it's so bizarre to do something so organic and raw to human nature, like rhythm, pulse, heartbeat, in such a modern time of communicating through Zoom and and these different mm -hmm. softwares to pass music back and forth and high quality yeah. and record a record. It's so interesting yeah. to put both those things together. That's yeah, amazing. it's so beautiful. And yeah, um, do you um, do you think that I'm trying to think of how this will resonate with people? Because I personally love music like this, but I think just the concept alone is enough to intrigue a listener. Um, and I don't think in a way where you're like, oh, I want to, I want to, you know, make money off this. That's always a nice thing too. But intrinsic, intrinsically, like to get people to listen to music in a different way or understand a different uh, viewpoint of it, which I think you did. I, I uh, can't wait for it to come out so I could start showing more people this thing. It's really mm -hmm. cool. I've never heard of anything like it, and I've heard so much music, and I study it, I teach it, I, I produce it. So this is really remarkable. I very much mm -hmm. enjoy it. It's really cool. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely – there's something – there's something really cool in it, I think, for a listener, in especially like when we when we get to do it live, because what's going to happen is like is that you have you have all, these very different kinds of attunement happening live because you have these you have you'll have us musicians 
in the room who are tuning in to each other to play music together to listen to what the other person's doing, but also deeply tuning in to an internal sound, you know, to the to the rhythm of the breath or to the rhythm of the heartbeat, the sound of either of those things. And so already like our hearing is going to be split in a couple of different places. And then you have an audience member who's listening to the whole, you know, the gestalt music coming off of the stage, coming out of the speakers and listening to that, but also listening to that, knowing that that's what's happening on the stage. So listening, okay, to that's what I'm hearing. There's like, there's these trying to, trying to connect what they're hearing to the, to the, internal rhythms of the people playing the music on stage and so listening for that listening for that relationship between what they're what they know they're doing under what they're playing and listening to what they're playing and then also i think the audience member is also then relating that to whatever's going on inside of them knowing that that's what the musicians are doing listening to this is coming directly at the speed of their heartbeat or at the speed of their breathing and then so the audience member then is listening paying attention tuning in to their own heartbeat or to their own breathing and trying to feel sort of the difference between theirs and what they're hearing on stage, you know, and you just have this kind of triangulation of, of external and internal listening between audience and performers alike. I think that's really a kind of a unique and pretty fascinating space to, to create in terms of people tuning into each other. Absolutely. I was just going to say, are you going to hand out stethoscopes to each person when they walk into the door? <laughs> no, but we're going to, we're going to have it set it up. We're going to have it set up so that we can bring an audience member or two onto stage with with us at some point so that we can use their heartbeat as something to play off of as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Which will be quite cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder, have you ever thought of one of you like playing your heartbeat through the PA so the audience can hear it as you play above it? Yeah. Yeah. That may, that may end up being part of it as well. We'll we'll see. There's a lot of things you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. That's remarkable. And, is this you both you both have other projects projects going on is have you always just found ways to play music in different ways as solo artists as you've been a part of other acts or groups is this something you've always done or is it maybe something you started doing more now with having more free time or through the pandemic or just getting older you want to focus more on other things that don't fit other projects you do it's an open question. Just curious, as a as a listener, as a music lover. I didn't know if I understood the question. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a multiple. I'm not sure if I understood. Okay, I'll I'm rephrase. Just, I'll rephrase. Just it. A simple answer and say yes. <laughs> I always, I always did. Do you always do? You always do music I, on I, the side. Is that what you're gonna say? Oh, no. I, oh, I, I didn't understand the question. Oh, is that the question? That's what I was getting. Oh, yeah. I don't. I don't think I understood the. Could you ask? I mean, ask, ask that I, again. I had we no kind idea of live, what we, the question was. We live on, and we, I think we, Susie and I both, like, we, we definitely are meeting in the middle of, like, very different musical life experiences, where I think, like, Susie's always been a really independent, like, independent artist, you know, known, Mm -hmm. known for what she's doing um, under her own name, whereas, like, I, you know, I'm in this, like, extremely well-known rock band, but have always also done all of this independent stuff, but that that I was less known for originally, so, so I think public there's like there's this kind of appearance where it's like oh guy in the famous rock band is now doing esoteric composition or whatever (laughs) which for me i've I've always been a contemporary musician yeah yeah, i've just always been doing my thing but the rock band (laughs) creates a certain you know (laughs) creates kind of a public framework but i've just always been doing a lot of a wide spectrum of stuff myself yeah isn't that funny i can uh, imagine that publicly (laughs) that's straight but yeah He's always also been a yeah. contemporary artist, and I think we both come to it as uh, in that way as as artists. I didn't even uh, I didn't even think about it. You know, <laughs> the universe has a funny sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, like, uh, remarkably and like anecdotally, the um, I knew about Susie. Uh, for quite a long time but the first time that i got to see her was i think it was 2008 and it was in sicily super randomly i was there arcade fire had like <laughs> arcade fire had canceled the tour and i was and i was like i was in norway or something and i was like what am i going to do and a, a friend of mine another friend of mine was playing in sicily 
And then, so I went there to like meet up with him and hang out and just explore a part of the world I'd never been. And then Susie was playing. I was like, oh, I'm going to stay longer so I can see this, oh, <laughs> see this lady do her thing in, in Catania. <laughs> but we didn't even know each other then. But that was the oh, first time no. I saw her play and, and really loved it. Yeah, yeah, in Catania, oh, this little arts That's art such a center. Beautiful place. It is, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I know, when we didn't meet, I didn't get to meet you, did I? No, I was just like, no. you know, quietly traveling about doing my own thing <laughs> and just went to see that, like as a oh, as a no. person would. <laughs> it is um life. It oh, it is amazing. strange. Yeah, you guys didn't know about each other, huh? I guess no. not. I no. thought I'd already told no. you that story. Maybe not. You <laughs> haven't told me that yet. I've been so busy, moment. you know, just you know, breathing and listening to our heartbeat. <laughs> We've been really busy just breathing. We're just focusing. You know, it's a great thing, though. Just simplify everything and focus on the breath and the heartbeat. I mean, it's so healthy. Absolutely. Wow, it is so healthy. Last night, hmm. my son gave me such zen, zen advice as a 14-year-old could. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm going to take it. I mm. have to just sim simplify, you know, breathe, listen, and, yeah, not try to carry the weight of the world. Everything just, wow. That, that was his advice? <laughs> um, it was a little more, what was it? Um, yeah, what, what you take in to your body, right, and what you choose. Having the ability to not take certain things in and, and what you do take in and positivity and negativity. I mean, yeah, my son, it was, it was really good. I was really mm. happy to have that, um, hear that from a teenager, you know, mm. to, yeah. a kind of light lightness, mm -hmm. you know, on, on that and how, how that comes into our body and, and our ability to, that it was sim it was simpler than I might think. That we complicate things, right? There's a lot mm. of things. There's a lot of noise. A lot of things going on, and we can complicate it. And it's actually quite simple. Mm. It's quite simple. Um, I don't know. Easy. I'm, 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 yeah, simple. it's always there, not, right? Not easy. Yeah. <laughs> the ease, the ease, and the simplicity is always there if we tune to it. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like he so learned from a something. wise mother. Yeah, it takes oh, one to know one. Yeah, right. <laughs> Susie. Oh, thank you. I think he also has got his own, so that's really blessing. Mm. Yeah, we have a lot to learn from from kids, and yeah, mm. absolutely. I said, oh, I gotta unravel some of this stuff. I'm, I'm just holding way too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it's it's always interesting when people do a lot of really different work or wonderful work, but like you go, going back a couple minutes, Richard. When you mention uh, Arcade Fire, it's like being like that can just put a, a complete block over the other things. Um, not that it fully has, but like that can happen to a lot of different indiv individuals who do certain things, but they're known for one thing. It's it's interesting because you said, well, I've been, you know, this is what I've been doing forever, probably before college. I mean, how long have you been playing music in general? Uh, I mean, I started playing piano when I was child I was probably six or seven your yeah. whole your whole life then been playing yeah. music yeah and and Susie how long have you been playing music I think I started on piano when I was like three. Oh wow yeah and then I was in choirs and stuff so both so of even you. I didn't become a vocalist I still love to be around voice mm -hmm. it's very cultural for me I feel like I just need to be very close to it because I grew up with a lot of it I, I, I like to have it in my ears mm -hmm. mm. um yeah. yeah, I think it's something that was very natural because it, it came, it was introduced really, uh, when I was very little. Piano or, or, or voice? Music. Oh, music. I mean, I remember some things of, of sitting on the floor with a teacher and they were, I was singing out notes. She was on the piano, but I don't really remember the fullness of how I learned those things, but I do remember. Um, hmm certain mm. images of that that are like little the piano was huge <laughs> <laughs> she was up here playing here and um i i do remember some some of those things mm -hmm. so you both came from musical backgrounds your parents musicians in, a, in any way yeah i grew up um, my dad was a folk musician i grew up in a kind of a, a very like oral tradition folk society around me yeah a lot of a lot of singing yeah and that's in Canada. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was a bunch of kind of expat British Isles folks that found each other in a kind of folk revival era. Oh, that's cool. What what and region of Canada? Uh, I was born in Toronto, but I live in Montreal. Oh, okay. Got it. And how about you, Susie? I, I can hear, I just wanted to make one comment. I, I can hear that aesthetic of the oral tradition, you know, because I think you're gravitating to this concept um, mm. with heart and breath. It, it really connects, mm. right? Mm. The contemporary mm. artist, contemporary composer with also the traditional oral tradition practice of how um, the synthesis of music in our body and stuff and how Mm. Tra the tra transmission of it also mm. it makes a mm. lot of sense i i mm. felt it it was definitely in there oh and, that's cool um, yeah no super cool super cool me yeah. um my family a big family with have four siblings and my parents um everybody except one brother plays <laughs> oh, okay. music but my parents are in medicine so i'm i was the only one who um there's like three of us who are artists and, and stuff, but yeah, my mother was a big uh, aficionado of music. My father played piano by ear, grew up um, in the Philippines playing piano by ear with his, his siblings, and my mom was just a big music aficionado. She loved music and art, so she put that into me. I was very uh, fortunate, very young, both visual art and music classes I had since I mean I can't even remember and then she loved the opera and I was the lucky one who got to go with her all the time mm -hmm. so I grew up also with that yeah so a lot of music around both of you I mean yeah it almost makes sense that you started wanting to play with heart and pulses at some point in your life with how much <laughs> music you've been around that's really cool really remarkable mm -hmm. uh, um before we start closing, is, is there anything else you'd like to talk about with this record or the production or the the, the, the story behind it? Anything else you miss or want to mention? I'm just excited for people to hear it. It's been like... Me too. We finished it a long... It feels like a long while back, and it's just been kind of treading water, I trying know. to trying to find its way out. So, it's, so I'm just excited to actually let it out into the world. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah, I'm excited to share the, the tracks that I, I'm, I'm not sharing with anybody, but that I will once it comes out. And I think the date, is it July 22nd? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And where can people find it? Just everywhere, all streaming services? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be, yeah. it'll be everywhere. And would you, uh, could you say the full name of the record and the composers just so everyone knows? Okay, I think it's tours. July 15th, right? I, think it's okay. July 15th. I, I it was yeah. the 15th also. Yeah, because today's the 22nd. Yeah. That's probably so where I got 22nd from. <laughs> yeah. So the yeah. single, single is Yeah, the first piece is out today. Um, yeah, the name of the album is Heart and Breath, Rhythm and Tone Fields. And it's the under the two of our names together. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So the record comes out July 15th. A single comes out today. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for, for sharing this information and telling, telling me about yourselves. I really appreciate it and your time. I'm excited to listen to it more and show some more friends. And I look forward to when you're on tour, especially in Chicago, if you do come through. Um, it was very nice to meet you both and to talk to you. Thank you again. And, and keep doing what you're doing. You both make amazing art. Oh, thank you so much. Nice to talk to you. Okay, well, take care, everybody. You too. Bye. Peace.